there are many people who have not won the Nobel Prize and some few who have. The writer we're going to treat tonight is Pearl Buck, who has been a controversial figure ever since she won the award for several reasons. First, she's an American who basically did not write about American themes. And one of the characteristics of the Nobel Prize is generally the fact that writers are giving you unique insight into their own culture over a long period of time. The second characteristic of Pearl Buck is almost a simple narrative style of writing. And when you realize that Hemingway was writing in a unique style, that Faulkner was giving you multiple and complex dialogue and interior monologues with interstices of historical events, when you realize that James Joyce, who didn't win the award, was giving you stream of consciousness in unparalleled brilliance, one of the questions was, why did Pearl Buck win the award? Her writing is simple. Her writing is straightforward. Much of her writing is polemical. She, she wants to express a moral point, and the stories move almost to a simplistic morality, and in some cases, an expected ending. Well, we're going to spend tonight trying to figure out why Pearl Buck won the Nobel Prize of Literature. We're going to concentrate, however, on her short stories in a collection of stories called 14 Stories, published in 1961. These stories came long after she won the Nobel Prize, and some people say that they follow a pattern of less qualitative writing than the committee awarded when she gave, uh, was earned the, tri uh, the prize for The Good Earth. Let's look at, first, her biographical details to get some idea of where she came from, where she had gone, and to get some idea what the content of her stories may have been or what may have inspired, what may have inspired them. First of all, we know Pearl Buck was born in 1892, June 26th, in Hillsborough, West Virginia. Her parents were Christian missionaries and lived in the interior of China. Their names Absalom and Caroline Sidenstreicher. Her grandparents were Dutch. They worked in Chinkang, where the Yangtze River met the Grand Canal. And they were in China at a time when the Manchester dynasty was coming toward its end. And the revolution, or the people's revolutions, stimulated by Marxist doctrine, were going to change the character of Chinese leadership and Chinese governance. In 1900, they actually fled the Boxer Rebellion. These were revolutionaries who sought to kill every white person, every Anglo person in China. And it led to a, uh, a brutal number of deaths. Fortunately, uh, Pearl Buck's family was able to flee to Shanghai, where they were found in 1909. In 1914, she earned a baccalaureate degree from Randolph-Macon Women's College and then returned to China to be with her mother. In 1917, she married John Lossing Buck, who was an American agricultural specialist in China. He was also in, uh, interested in Christian philosophy, but as his scientific interest grew, he became much more immersed in scientific activity, much less in missionary or in uh, religious polemicals. In 1920, P 
Pearl Buck gave birth to a child, Grace, who suffered from PKU. Essentially, she was a, uh, a young lady suffering from a disease that, or a sickness or a condition, you might say, that never let her grow up. She remained infantile all her life. And many, many years later, uh, Pearl Buck could only could do nothing more than to send her boxes of crayons in the home where they had placed her for so many years in New Jersey. In 1950, Pearl Buck wrote a, uh, a story in the Ladies' Home Journal called The Child Who Never Grew Up Suffering from Phenyl Ketonuria, PKU, and then she turned it into a book. That child, born in 1920, I understand died just two years ago. But in the delivery of the child, uh, Pearl Buck suffered damage to her uterus and was never able to have children again. This comes up in story after story, the love of a mother for her child, devotion to children, the desire for children, and the treatment of children. And we'll find more, we'll learn more about some of these details as the evening progresses. In 1921, she taught English at the University of Nanking. In 1926, back in the States, she earned a master's degree at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. She returned in 1927 to Nanking, where there were major revolutionary events, but in particular, the government of Chiang Kai-shek, the Kuomintang government challenging the communists, invaded Nanking, and literally teenage soldiers ravaged the town, killed more than 44 people, and Pearl Buck and her family heard the sounds of the soldiers crashing into houses around them and crashing into their house at the moment that American gunships off the shore started shelling Nanking. And the revolutionaries and, and the Chiang Kai-shek troops pulled away and Pearl Buck's family narrowly escaped death. So she is involved throughout her years in revolutionary activity. We'll see how this affects her life and how it affect, affects her being. In 1930, she published her first novel, East Wind, West Wind, and in 1931, The Good Earth. We're not going to go into this work, but before the end of the first year, it had gone into 17 printings. It was republished in 30 languages in Sweden, Arabia, France, India, three languages in Russia, and pirated in China and Japan. These details come in a book called American Winners of the Nobel Literary Prize, published in Oklahoma in 1968. She won the Pulitzer Prize in 1932 for The Good Earth. By 1935, The Good Earth had grown into three, a trilogy of three volumes dealing with the descendants of the first figures in The Good Earth. In 1935, she divorced John Lossing, Buck, partially because of the difficulty in dealing with the child. And then she married uh, Richard Walsh, the president of the John Day Company. In the, year, in the year, she also won the William Dean Howells Award. In 38, she found the Nobel Prize for Literature. In 1941, she founded the East and West Association, which, among other things, was concerned about the treatment of children born to Asian and non-Asian parents. And from that point on, Pearl Buck had a mission in life to try to find an identity and find a home for people of mixed racial birth who either were deserted by their families or were orphans. She wrote a number of children's books. The Chinese Children Next Door in 1942, 
the water buffalo in 1943. In 1948, the big wave. But she also published a lot of novels. I guess she wanted just to change her identity and change her name and find different sponsorship under the name of John Sedges. So any novels you find under John Sedges are Pearl Bucks. In 1949, she founded the Welcome House, an adoption agency for Asian American children. In 1956, a powerful book, Imperial Woman, which uh, describes one of the most powerful women emperors of China, in fact, perhaps the only major woman emperor of China, because among other things, Pearl Buck was advancing a feminist agenda, understanding the need for women in China to emerge into modern civilization. In 1957, she wrote a letter from Peking, which really disguised her love affair with the Chinese poet Xu Qimo, or Xu Jim. And this was, she found out that her first husband was unfaithful to her. This was her response. But she never revealed the story. And John Day, her, the publisher, and her second husband told her never to tell the story until much later. And she told it after. 1961, 14 stories appeared, the book we're going to deal with. And in 1964, the Pearl Buck Foundation was established for children of half American parentage born in Asia and still living there, and of course, subject to considerable prejudice. In 1973, at the age of 67, Pearl Buck died of cancer and was buried in Pennsylvania, a place designated a National Historic Site and the international headquarters of the Pearl Buck Foundation. Here is a woman who wrote novels, who was involved in the revolutionary times and the revolutions in China, who was advanced in the actions and who promoted the actions of women and who assumed certain leadership as well with a child suffering a, uh, an illness or suffering a condition that could not be repaired. There are a lot of aspects to Pearl Buck. We'll hear some of them tonight and we're going to begin first with a story that's about an American family. And one of the, f the first story in 14 stories, and a very powerful story called A Certain Star. And Miss Beverly Hood is going to introduce us to A Certain Star. Hello. For anyone in doubt, I'm now standing up. This is as good as it gets. Um, a Certain Star is a short story about four people, a family. The dad is Arnold Williams. He's a nuclear scientist, one of the top three in the world, who has devoted his entire being to his researches. He has a commanding presence, an authoritative demeanor, except when confronted with a crying daughter or an ailing wife. He is fascinated with space and the mysteries of energy. He believes in good and abhors violence, which he considers subhuman. I tried to find a connection between the life of this character and possibly the real life of Edward Teller or Robert Oppenheimer, who worked on the atomic bomb, or perhaps between Pearl Buck's own father, who with his interests in religion and science, must have faced some of these same moral dilemmas. But I found nothing to substantiate that in print. Helen is the mom. She is a steady, long-suffering woman who has ceased to have romantic illusions about recapturing her love with her husband. She is willowy in stature and has a head of tumble uh, that is a tumble of 
silvery curls, it says. Her deteriorating health, I believe, typifies the deteriorating love within their family. How is the son? He's 18. He's six feet tall, handsome, fresh skin, big bone, dark hair that is too long, his father thinks. He's not deeply motivated about anything, and he's not trying to really make the grade in college. Anne is the daughter. She's 20. She's small in stature, delicate yet hearty. She's pretty. She's described as feverish, which I take to be assertive and spunky and driven. She seems to be replaying her personal drama of lack of attention from her father by having a lover who is a married man who can't give her the attention that someone else might. They seem to face what is, to me, the, the key mark of this whole thing is about fear and going into an age of change where every, nothing is going to be the same as it was and the way that they react to these changes. Arnold wants to shake it and figure it out, and Helen would probably become submerged in it. Anne, on the other hand, would be, you know, frantically trying to figure it out, and Hal would be apathetic. So you have uh, really, really different characters going on here. Uh, some of the symbols in the story, of course, you have the star, which just covers a whole bunch of, of stuff. I mean, it could symbolize so, so many things. It's the guiding influence, I believe, that represents the combination of science and God. It's the uniting of the nuclear age and the heavens, which both will reshape their worlds in the future. The event happens at Christmas, which is a time of sharing. The time they share is more important than anything they will give to each other other than that. Um, the aimlessness of his son, I believe, and of his daughter's love affair gives credence to the fact that they are going to be a part of a generation that sees kind of a pervasive hopelessness that may go on because of the atomic bomb. Uh, the farm and the laboratory are the antithesis of each other. The farm is the foundation. He talks about going back to the farm. Um, whereas the laboratory is at the other end of the spectrum where even something that is the, used for the maximum destructive ability in the world is condoned because it's science and actually encouraged. When he gets to the farm, he can see the star again. And this is significant because the star, he needs something to guide him on his way. The story opens with the family making ready or being commanded to make ready by the father to go to the country for Christmas. And now at the farm, he wakes early to make this pilgrimage to see if this star that was so important to him and really got him turned on to science in the first place with his very first telescope, if he can still see that star. He goes out and he finds that he can. And he recalls while he's looking at this star a lot of things that have happened in their marriage and where he is at with his life and how much he wants his family back. He goes in and talks to his wife about this. In the beginning, I think the story is really set with what she says on the first page. I, I am used to your large announcements, darling. And things are about as they have been since the war ended. Everything's changed. It's inevitable. To me, this is like double entendre. I mean, it's, everything's changed. It's inevitable. Everything's the same as it's been. Okay. And his answer to her is the foundations don't change. We must get back to being a family. I'll have the car ready in an hour. So with that, they take off down to the farm. He sees the star which gives him back a sense of perspective about his own life, which he has spent much of it in a laboratory. Um, his wife observes when he talks to her about it that she wishes that he could have as much enthusiasm for their relationship and be as enchanted with you know, the family as he has been with the nucleus. So, But he thinks that the nucleus is 
you know, of the atom is just where it's at. You know, I mean, he really is into that because that's his life. Um, their conversation to me remains pretty much at level one of intimacy because they're talking about Christmas presents, they're talking about mundane things. They're not really talking about what motivates him gut level or any of them. It's like there's an elephant in the living room. We're uh, ostracized from each other. We're isolated from each other, and nobody is talking about that. Um, then he has an interlude with his daughter who remarks that he's been away for 10 years, so we're just reiterating that. He awakens his son, and they go out to cut down a Christmas tree, and in the dialogue with his son, his son calls him atomic killer, and Arnold reach out and hits him, recalling a similar incident with his own father where they scuffled and wrestled and all that. But Hal doesn't react the same way as he did. This is a new breed of son. And by the non-reaction, by the not bringing them closer together like the original confrontation with his dad did, it seems that he doesn't really know what to do about that. And that makes him angry and perplexed. Although by striking Hal, he's been able to release a lot of the frustration that he feels about his family. When they get back to the house, his daughter's response is predictably, well, are you going to hit me too? You know, not because she thinks that he's such a violent man, but because she doesn't know what to think about him anymore. And I think she tells the entire story in what she says, we don't know you. You've become a stranger to us. He compares her then with the star, the honesty, the straightforwardness, the direction of the star. She has given him an imperative to which he must respond. And he says that he has felt lost in his own house for a long time. Then he comes face to face with the fact that a fear has unfolded itself and it's hideous, anything is hideous and possible in the future. And it's, sh it's a shadow that's unexplained. And then we come to the part where he feels that he must talk to them about what has been going on with him all these years he was away. And he goes into the analysis of what he believes God to be now and bringing God and science together for him and saying that what he did he needed to do to save innocent, more innocent people from losing their lives essentially. The work is a short story of some 23 pages and the dialogue moves the characterization within the story and it's obvious that the characters have respect for language because they endeavor to listen to one another when they're talking together. The antidote of the story is the farmhouse setting, the reunion of the family that has been estranged from one another. And I think it, the denouement comes in the kitchen when they finally have to talk to one another. Um, it's built around the theme that all things change whether you're paying attention to them or not, whether you will for them to change or not. Just by not being there, people, relationships, and situations that don't receive attention and nurturing inquiry on a regular basis can easily wither, die, or go awry, such as happened with his family. And now he brings them back together, which was his goal for Christmas. Um, they, uh, he also compares this to the changes that are going to go on that they all see are going to happen to Herod trying to kill the child, which of course was the Christ child at Christmas. And he compares that to the, to the new age, but nobody can do that. Nobody and nothing. There's no going back to what we were. We couldn't kill the child and we can't destroy the creative nucleus of an atom. It's eternal. It's there. We have to learn how to use it for good and only for good. And I think the whole story is summed up with you'll have to go on faith. And to me this, um, 
is reiterated by Pro Buck's own philosophy, which said, the uncommitted life is not worth living. We either believe in something or we don't. This story gives us a greater insight into her character and commitment to peace and integrity without blame. To say neither good or bad about the atomic bomb, what happened, is characteristic. It is that we will be forever changed because it happened. And now we have the necessity to deal with it and keep our humanity at the same time. And that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hood. I think you've given us <clears throat> not only the nature of the characters, you've given us a discussion of some of the central symbols, including the star. You've shown us the conflict in the family, and you've indicated that this may be a story that people should read on Christmas Day, since the father wants to relive and rejuvenate his family with his boyhood memories. But a lot of events have passed from those boyhood memories, and the world is no longer innocent. After his father strikes Hal, and they have this confrontation in the forest on Christmas Day, they go back to the house, and the father has to protest. He says, you understand Hitler would have destroyed us. He was after the bomb too. We were only months ahead. But Germany had surrendered and said, Japan hadn't, he retorted. And there were subhumans there who wanted to keep on fighting. It's the subhuman we have to watch. The nature of the bombs falling is still a point of controversy. I was only 10 when it happened in summer camp. And when I heard the war was over, I was only grateful that American relatives would be returning home without having to invade Japan. That's one perspective. Others may have a different perspective, but I've not had a chance to change my mind on that issue. But Pearl Buck was involved in monumental issues. And I just want to mention a few historical points of historical perspective so that we understand where she was, where she is, and what she stood for. We had mentioned that in 1898, Chu Si was on the throne, the most powerful woman in the 250-year history of the Cheng Dynasty. And it was to end soon. Among other things, you had the Boxer Rebellion in 1900, where 44 Christian missionary families were murdered. And troops came from all directions to try to save the country or else to protect the missionaries from Japan, Russia, Great Britain, and France. I've already mentioned the invasion of Nanking by Chiang Kai-shek's troops. Again, this conflict which was to concern itself and conclude or at least halt momentarily at the beginning of World War II when the Chinese banded together in their common cause against the Japanese. In 1931, the Yangtze River flooded. It engorged an area the size of New York State. The waters did not recede for two months. Two million people died of drowning, dysentery, cholera, cholera, famine and 14 million families were homeless. This is the milieu that Pearl Buck understood, and this is the area where she lived and where she wrote, or at least the material about which she did write. But interestingly enough, when she wrote about the communist revolution, 
she was not entirely sympathetic. And in fact, in 1972, when Richard Nixon went to China, China refused Pearl Buck's request for a visa. The communist government did not approve of her writing, didn't approve of the people with whom she sympathized, didn't even approve of writers whom she applauded in China. In fact, she received a letter of denial for her visa to China. She could not go with Richard Nixon from a Chinese envoy stationed in Canada and a minor functionary at that, another insult. And they simply wrote to her, Dear Miss Pearl Buck, your letters have been duly received in view of the fact that for a long time you have in your works taken an attitude of distortion, smear, and vilification towards the people of New China and its leaders. I am authorized to inform you that we cannot accept your request for a visit to China. She was shocked that she who, she who thought she knew Chinese, at least the Chinese living in the hinterland in the country, better than anyone else, would be vilified by the government itself. Chu Enlai considered Pearl Buck an enemy of the revolution. And in fact, she had two startling setbacks in her life, which in some ways show up in the stories. Number one, Lu Shun, China's greatest 20th century literature figure, according to an account, in a 1933 letter dismissed her work as superficial, and her work has not been rehabilitated in China since. And in 1972, the year that she had hoped to go to China with Nixon, the National Association of Black Social Workers objected to the placement of black children with white parents for foster care and adoption. Pearl Buck herself had adopted two black children. And she s wrote in Today's Health a magazine article in January 1972. She said, I am the better woman for having my two black children, Henriette and Chico. The reason I'm introducing this material to you is to indicate that here is a woman who did not stand back from controversy, who involved herself in controversy, and who suffered recrimination because of it. But she held to her standards, and her foundation today is an international foundation for placing mixed racial uh, families and mixed racial children who need, who need families. I had mentioned to you that Family is one of the major structural understandings of literature. Deal with family and deal with the concepts of family, and in fact, you become attracted to your reader, and your reader wants to look at more. I'd like to spend some time looking at two short stories. One is The Beauty, and the other is The Silver Butterfly. Both deal with the emergence of women in the Chinese culture. But one deals with the family by itself, the other deals with the revolutionary case, and both are stories in 14 stories. Now the story Beauty is a rather compelling story. It deals with a woman who is obliged to care for her children at night by herself because her husband goes to a bar. And every night he goes to the bar, and the children know he's going to come home drunk. But her obligation is to stay with the children. But one night she realizes that she's not going to do that anymore. She's going to go to the bar, and she is, in fact, going to confront her husband. She's met at the bar with some of the bar ladies. And the madam of the bar, the owner, brings her into another room and seats her and tries to separate herself and keep her apart from her husband. And at that point, a beautiful woman comes over 
who introduces herself to Mrs. O'Mora, and they have a conversation. And Mrs. O'Mora breaks down. And she says, I can't stand it anymore. Why doesn't my husband come home? All he does is stay here and look at you beautiful women. And I have needs too. And I want him at home. And an understanding develops between these two women. And Mrs. O'Mora discovers that perhaps she ought not be by herself at, at night. And the woman who is addressing her wants to open a dress shop. And they come to an agreement where the bar girl gets the funding to open a dress shop. And she actually enlists Mrs. O'Mora to come to her dress shop and help her sew dresses at night while her husband's at the bar. And they form a partnership, a business partnership. This girl at the bar, this beauty, and Mrs. O'Mora. And one night, Mrs. O'Mora's husband does come home earlier. He doesn't go to the bar. And Mrs. O'Mora has a problem. She's supposed to go help this beauty sew. And so she gives an excuse that she's going to see a friend. She has a right to see a friend. The story ultimately evolves into a realization. When Mr. O'Mora discovers that his wife has gone into business, that she has skills beyond his understanding, and that she's a woman who needs her independence as well, And the story, as it evolves, brings an accommodation between Mrs. O'Moore and her husband, who respects her and realizes that his departure deprived her of their relationship. Her business deprived him of knowledge of her skills. And he realizes that she's a modern woman. And the story ends with her asking him no longer, asking her him, asking her no longer to kneel before him, as a Japanese woman usually does, but instead to be his equal. The story ends somewhat happily, even though it may be somewhat simplistic. Now let's look at a few details of this story, because it is a compelling story. Now when we look at Pearl Buck's stories, they're simple, but they're simply deceptive because to some extent she is adopting certain types of writing patterns known to the Chinese, and I'll mention them in a little while. But Pearl Buck achieves much of her tension in her stories and much of the consciousness of her stories through dialogue, through conversation. And while we are admitted to the insights of these individuals, it's the dialogue that allows us to focus on the primary issues. We understand that the family is changing. Setsu, at 12, is her daughter, growing acclimated to American culture. And in the beginning, we find that Mrs. Omura goes to an American rock and roll concert in Japan. This setting is in Japan, not in China. And she comes back embarrassed by the attitude of these young teenagers, by their music, by their worship of the entertainers, by their failure to command their own conduct and to sit, sit respectfully. And the story opens essentially by showing us Mrs. O'Mura's adherence to tradition. But when Setsu asks why her father isn't home, on page 27 of your text, the daughter parodies what the mother will say. And at this point, the mother realizes the sham that she's living. Uh, Setso broke up. 
Asetsu broke in, and he comes home at two in the morning and expects you to be waiting for him with smiles and pity. My poor one, you are so tired. You have been working for our family all these hours. Here is your tea. I've drawn the hot water for your bath. Sleep until the children are gone to school. And here's the teenage daughter, 12 years old, not even a teenager, telling her mother how she sounds in this deferential state, no longer part of an occupied Japan. And she realizes, Mrs. Omura, perhaps she was old-fashioned. Perhaps there is no reason why she should go on living this stupid life. And so she dresses and goes to the Golden Moon Bar, where her husband resides. The cab driver is a moralist. He doesn't understand why she's there. He loses respect. He says, old Japan is gone. Women go to bars with the men. What becomes of the children? Ironically, because he does not understand that Mrs. Omura is trying to protect the children at this point. And when the lady in red, this beauty appears before Mrs. Omura in the restaurant, we have her saying to this woman, almost blurting out a confessional to a woman she's never seen before, you cannot imagine what it is to sit alone evening after evening, year after year, to wait for two o'clock when he comes home, and then to be compelled to smile and pretend to welcome him, never asking him a question for fear, he will be angry and not come home at all. So the woman, accustomed, worried that she needs support, needs this conversation. The bar girl herself admits she hates all men. She says there are so many of them and they are all the same. They are quite stupid. Each thinks himself irresistible. Barmaid says she first came to the bar at the age of 16. She's been there 12 years, and at 28, she wants to leave. And Mrs. Omura gives her some encouragement. She says, leave her husband alone. Go into dressmaking. And here we have an interesting development. Now, to some extent, the story is contrived. Of course, Pearl Buck is writing it so that it concludes the way it does. How many opportunities are there for the wife of a husband to go to a barmaid and say, go into business and leave this situation? It's, it's contrived. But when Mrs. O'Mora returns to the, the bar the next time, she discovers that the bar girl has invested in a dress shop. The bar girl has no family. Her family sold her. And so Mrs. Omura and her family becomes part of the bar girl's life. Pearl Buck describes how the business grew. And it's really very insightful. It suggests to us that there are some people who can run a business, and some who cannot. Look at this description. And look at the psychology that penetrates our understanding of these figures. The shop was on the edge of the Ginza, probably someplace like the Galleria. The shop was on the edge of the Ginza, where many people came and went. The beauty herself was a good saleswoman. She had only to linger in the doorway, or to be busy at the window, to have people stop to watch what she was doing. Men stopped because she was so beautiful. And women stopped to see what the men were looking at. And here's the key. Then, forgetting the men, they went into the shop to buy the dresses. So we know that this is a successful operation. We are well, on, are well aware of the fact that uh, Mrs. Omura is going to change her life and change the life of the bar girl and change the life of her family. 
And that's essentially what happens in the story called The Beauty. A poignant story, a story of family relations, a story that ends happily. The husband chooses to stay and gives her wife greater respect. A story that is not so happy is another one called The Silver Butterfly. And that deals with the revolution. This is obviously one of the stories that turned the Chinese communists against Pearl Buck and caused the writers of the country to denigrate her work. The story begins with a reporter in Hong Kong, presumably Pearl Buck herself, interviewing a man who has a story to tell about the revolution and who will tell, who will tell the story only in privacy and only in confidentiality because he doesn't want his identity known. The interview is in a darkened room and Pearl Buck says the voices begin to drown out and they become instruments by which we identify the pulse and the concept of the revolution. We find out that the man speaking tells us about a landowner in a village near the Yangtze River, a village with a cluster of brick-walled, tile-roofed houses of central China. And you have the, the fancy landowner, and you have the poor who live about him. The landowner, we find out, owns 20 acres of land. Now, in Texas, that doesn't sound like a lot. But for a person to own 20 acres of land when so many others are poor means that there is a perspective difference that we identify. And the male is talking about his mother, who is a concubine for the landlord. Not only do we have a woman who is by herself this concubine, but she is in conflict with the mother, the wife of the landlord, whose children are on an equal plane with hers to the extent they're fathered by the same man and not equal to the extent that one is the wife and one is the concubine. We find out that she, she had, this man had a five-year-old brother who died. He was an older son. She gave birth at the age of 40, somewhat embarrassing to be giving birth at a that, at, at that age, but the second son died. This becomes later an important part of the story. The revolution takes place. At page 202, we realize that the revolutionaries have moved in to destroy the landlords and to turn the land in a popular revolution over to the people. The communists execute the landlord by hanging him by his thumbs, that is the boy's father who is telling the story, the man whose concubine, is tell whose concubine son is telling the story, this man, the landlord, is hung up by his thumbs and flayed to death as, as an example of what happens to the rich and what happens to those who would exploit the people. The revolution is underway, 1920, 1921, 1922. The same story is told by Pa Chin in a book called The Family, another popular novel, but, but, but by a Chinese. The family is dispersed, and the young man, the son of the concubine, goes to work as a bookkeeper because he had a bit of an education. But working in the cooperatives and later in the communes, he works as a bookkeeper part of the day 
The rest of the day, he has to help dig foundations for the bridge. And we have some idea of the hard work on this bridge. The mother, however, the concubine, her brain is muddled by the revolution. The change of events have left her distraught, left her weak, left her old, and left her without a ration because she cannot work. The mother is always hungry. All the workers get a ration, get a ration, not the mother. She doesn't work. She wants pork. She can't understand why she can't have a little bit of pork, why she can't have a little bit of rice, why they can't have a pig in the backyard that they can slaughter when they need food. And one of these points that Pearl Buck mentions here is the realization that the revolution, which was supposed to give, an, have, have, which was supposed to have given everybody something more than they had, now has turned out where most people have nothing. The mother, the concubine, sees a guest come to her house. She doesn't understand the food situation. She takes a bowl of rice and gives it to the guest. And the rumor is going to spread that this family has more than it should have. The question is, should, how are you going to treat a woman who is going to cause your family pain? Should you put her to death? There are changes of circumstances, however. The son's wife gets a job in the cafeteria. And she is able to secrete rice in a lotus leaf and sneak it out so her mother can eat, so her mother-in-law can eat. Other circumstances change. The commander, the son of the village barber, the commander of the enterprise, the man who is moving these workforces, the man in charge of the encampment, is the son of a barber. That is, here's a person, a peasant. A barber is an ignorant man. He doesn't read. He can carry out business. He can carry out a conversation. But he doesn't read. He doesn't teach his children to read. And this man is the commander. That's how far the revolution has corrupted social institutions. Ignorance governing ignorance. The mother, however, is treated by this commander with some kindness. He asks her to work in a nursery. And because she works in the nursery, she can get a portion of food. But the nursery is located in the old house where she was a concubine, where she had status, where she reigned over children, where she was the mistress, the concubine of the landlord. And on an equal partner, she insisted, with the landlord's wife. The, the house had become a basket factory, a barracks for soldiers. And the mother is absolutely confused by it all, an old woman. And then she is given the charge of a five-year-old child. A five-year-old child. And that five-year-old child reminds her of the son she has lost. She wants to protect the child. She wants to indulge the child. And then she remembers that she has hidden jewels in a shed, in a wall near a shed, that she can give to this child and show to this child. And she goes to this cache and takes out of it some jewels that are not valuable, but she takes out a silver butterfly. The silver butterfly becomes a symbol of culture. And she shows it to the young man and tells him not to tell anyone, but what, young, what little boy can keep a secret? He tells someone else, and he tells, and that someone else tells the head of the school. And the mother is brought on trial. 
The mother is brought on trial for having wealth that she kept for herself. The six-year-old boy who, or the, the boy who was given the silver jewelry is punished for wanting something that other people can't have. The communal philosophy, the communal psychology must prevail. And so the mother is put on trial, this concubine. Put on trial for the silver butterfly. And she's humiliated. She has to run through a gauntlet with her hands tied behind her. This old woman. She falls and people kick her and the commander requests her son to kick her. And she looks up and she sees that this is what the son must do to her if he is going to sustain his place as part of this unselfish revolution, and if he is going to condemn people who want property of their own and value jewelry. And the story ends with the old woman putting the five-year-old child on her shoulders, moving clandestinely out of the compound and down into the river where she walks slowly into the river covers her head and holding the child on her shoulders immerses him in the water and both she and the child drown. While the son's wife looks on. The reporter turns to the son who's telling this story and the reporter says and your wife I asked, she did nothing? The voice replied, my wife is a kind woman. She did nothing. There's no wonder when you read a story like this. Written in 1961 or published in 1961, that the Chinese... 11 years later would prevent Pearl Buck from coming back to China. And then they also remember in 1933 what the attitude was toward the good earth. People have long memories. I don't think you can forget this story either. We're going to go on and move into another story today. And Mr. Michael Youngblood is going to discuss Beyond Language. These are compelling stories, and they become part of the Pearl Buck legend. The story I'm discussing today, like Dr. Rothman said, is beyond language. Um, before I start beginning to talk about the story, it's just to cover some points that he talked about. Um, Pearl Buck's writing is simple. Um, first time when I started reading it, I read some Hemingway. So I was reading it and it seems so simple and it almost seems elementary in a way until you really start trying to understand what she's saying or what she's, the point she's making. There's different levels to her writing. And there's a few passages in Beyond Language that I'd like to share with you that would really point that out. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to go over with you the way the story is laid out and you know some uh, brief background about what the story is actually about. Um, it's kind of small, so I'm not sure if it's going to show up extremely well on the TV. Um, it's just a summary. Um, it starts out with a uh, member of the Chinese military He's basically a translator uh, trained by two e ladies from New England. And uh, he works for a general that he is dependent upon. Um, Liang is his name. The general is very dependent upon people around him. He's uneducated. He's basically a warlord thug, uh, very corrupt. Um, and he's, without the people around him, he would be totally lost. And Liang, Liang is one of those people that he surrounds himself with to protect himself um, 
you know, just day-to-day -day life. Uh, what the story, how the story unfolds is that he is sent to America um, basically to study the social and economic uh, uh, programs or whatever in America, but really it's just to get rid of him for a year. Um, he had uh, started a war with Japan and lost, and, and the Chinese were very embarrassed by him. So they wanted to get rid of him, uh, is basically the long and the short of it. Because Liang understand, understood ling, uh, in, in English so well, excuse me, uh, he was chosen to be sent uh, with the general uh, to America. Uh, he had always wanted to go to America, so he's very, very excited when the general chose him to go. Um, but his family wasn't so happy. Um, his mother was very, very upset about the news. Um, his father was listening to his mother cry, uh, is pleading with him and uh, asking, uh, his mother was asking his father to try to stop them. Well, his mother, his uh, uh, dad was a very uh, wealthy banker in a central Chinese town of Tietzen. Uh, so his mother pleads with him and his father says, well, I'll try to do something about it. So he goes and meets with the general. Unbeknownst to, to the father, uh, Liang had already slipped out of the house and took a shortcut to get to the general first and told the general that uh, he's going to be going to America and Americans are sharp and very smart so he needs him very much if he's going to survive in America basically and be able to communicate and all that. So the father goes and with the intentions of bribing uh, the general um, to get him to not allow his son to go to America. And I, I, it's really hard to understand when you're reading the story, why was the family so opposed of the son going to America? And I think it's just that. It's an only son. He had only been married uh, about uh, four months, five days, uh, four months and five days or something like that. And so they were afraid. Of course, uh, America is a far off place in, in the uh, traditional Chinese family unit. Uh, the eldest son, the only son in this case, uh, shouldn't leave. He should stay and, and continue on in the family. And, and I guess there was a fear, and it wasn't said by Pearl Buck in the story, but I guess there was a fear that uh, he wouldn't come back. You know, maybe he would find a better life in America, and he wouldn't come back. And in fact, there's a, another uh, character in the story, which was a tailor that was frantically trying to make the general 12 suits before he left China. And uh, the tailor actually did stay in America. So I think there was some, maybe some truth to that. So uh, anyway, they, he tried to bribe him. didn't work. So they all end up going to America. And there, there's some humor in Pearl Buck's stories, too. It's basically the general's taking um, all of his wives, all of his wives' children, uh, just hordes of people go with him. Um, and uh, uh, he's crossing the ocean. And of course, you have to remember that the general is not an educated man, and he couldn't understand why the ships. He was seasick, uh, extremely seasick, and, and Liang was basically being a, basically a housemaid to the guy, and going across the ocean. And he couldn't understand why the ship's captain couldn't stop until um, he got over his seasickness. And of course, uh, I mean, if, if you're on, in an ocean, it's pretty hard, <laughs> hard to stop, you know, long enough when you cannot be seasick. So he goes to America. Then the, the rest of the story is basically how uh, Liang um, meets another woman. Uh, his, her name was Josie. Remember, he's already married, but he's married with to a wife that is an arranged marriage from childhood. He didn't love the woman, didn't even really know the woman. Um, at least he didn't know, he didn't think he loved the woman. Uh, so what it happens is, uh, the, you know, just to continue, the new wife is upset, tries to bribe. The young wife surprises him and expresses her feeling of, of, of loss at his leaving. She really doesn't want him to go, uh, but of course he does. And he meets a woman named Josie. Uh, he is both impressed and offended by her behavior. What I mean by that, uh, and I'm going to move up to a passage within the story uh, about when he meets Josie and uh, about how he really falls for her. Uh, and, it's, and it really shows the conflict between the American culture and the Chinese culture. Basically what he expects a woman to, um, just like his arranged marriage wife does, basically when, when um, someone enters a room 
she leaves the room. She doesn't talk publicly to uh, anyone except him in private uh, if he's talking to someone else in the room. So there's a lot of really strict cultural adherence that he's been raised in. And he, he's really surprised by uh, Josie and the way she acts. Uh, and, it, and it starts out by there's a, a speech that the general is going to give to the Cantonese Merchants Association, and Josie's father was was a wealthy merchant, and uh, that was the head of this association. So he's going to give a speech, and you have to understand in China there's many many dialects, just like in India. There's and some parts of China people can't understand other people in other parts of China, and uh, uh, the general and Liang is from a different part of China. So the general gave up, stands up to give his speech. And of course, Liang is translating the speech to a group of these Cantonese businessmen in America. And he, they couldn't understand a word he was saying. And Josie happened to be Cantonese. And someone in the crowd yelled, you know, up there uh, says, uh, well, where's Josie? And she comes up. And instantaneously, basically, the general speaks, Leanne speaks, Josie speaks, and they translate it to the crowd, and which is kind of an amazing feat when you think of translating from one language to another, e e even though it's a dialect within Chinese. But he was, he was uh, smitten by her, basically. Uh, because of her strength and because of the fact that she wasn't afraid of him, she, didn't, she, wasn't, cow she wasn't bullied by him uh, at all. And, what the, and it really kind of, kind of brings it to a point uh, when uh, really let me, yeah, here it is. He's talking, and, and, and it's after the, he gives the speech, and, and that's when the general notices her, too. And remember the, uh, the tailor making 14 suits for the general? There's a um, term in most uh, literature that's round and gold, and they talk about the general's buttons being gold, and uh, all of his wives. And, and he spotted Josie, and he, he asked Liang to go, go get her. And it, it doesn't say for sure, Pearl Buck doesn't work it in, but it's only understood the fact that he's hoping to have Josie as a notch in his belt, basically. Uh, so Liang then feels some attraction to her, even though he had been confrontational with her. He insulted her by calling her Japanese because she was uh, half American and half Chinese, and he said she looked like Japanese. And that's an insult for the Chinese of the time, of course, because the uh, Japanese and Chinese hate each other. And uh, she came back very strongly and bluntly by basically saying that, uh, uh, you know, you know uh, that was a, w a worse insult than uh, any Japanese could make or, or something to that effect. So, so, so she was very strong, very, very much opposite of what you think that he would be attracted to from the story. But yet he was, and uh, he didn't want the general to have any part of her, so he lied to the general, told the general that um, uh, he couldn't find her, when in fact he could. And this kept kind of going on, and he kept trying to uh, basically hide her. And she wouldn't stay hidden. And really, really when it starts to really come out, as far as the quality of the story, as far as the underlying message, it says, uh, and this kind of reading from the story on page 78, he said, uh, inside himself, Liang said, Liang said that there would be no more times I will tell her, tell her to stay at home. And he continues on, and she asked him, why should I stay at home? I am amused by that old fat general. And how can he say to her plainly, the general is a lecherous old man, one did not put such thoughts into a virtuous woman's head. Again, this is the sort of traditional Chinese military translator speaking to a, essentially an American woman. And she finds it rather humorous. He, 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 he began pompously, as an older brother might speak to a young wayward sister. The general might uh, place you in difficulty. You might begin negotiations with your father. Of course, that is implying that uh, it would begin negotiations with her father to make her be some kind of an arranged r r relationship with him or send her off or whatever. I can't really get the details of that. But Josie Pang laughed and and laugh, my father, he would not think of forcing me to do anything I did not want. He knows I will only marry the man I love. Well, she was, she was as bold as that. He had never heard the word love upon any woman's tongue, but it rolled from her like any common word 
the man I love, he could not bear the phrase, this could not be, there could not be such a man. Who is this man, he demanded. She looked at him smiling, arched, assured, as no other woman ha had ever looked at him, her enchanting face alive. And that really basically right there is, is saying that Josie, he is the man for Josie. And he didn't know how to take it. Basically, they just turned around and left each other. And that's the little subtlenesses of her stories and her writing, that it is a dialogue. And, and one of the criticisms of her writing is basically that it is simple dialogue. It is very straightforward. There isn't a lot of depth to the characters. But yet, uh, I found it to be interesting that she can, have, she can do so much with such, such sparse dialogue. You take just a very short passage in a short story, and you really see that there's description between the dialogue, of course. And comparing that with, say, Hemingway, which is the, the entire story is carried out through dialogue. And you, ten people can read it, and ten people can get, can get different impressions, but yet the story progresses in the same way at rate. And it's amazing, but yet uh, Pearl Buck would do the narrative and then the short passages, and it gets the message across. Call it directed, call it whatever you want, but it's still uh, she she can get the he, she can get the message across in the story that she wants to get across. Basically, then what happens is the general grows tired of America and he wants to return to China. The basic question is what does Liang do? Uh, what can he do without Josie? And what about his wife? And this brings in a concept in literature that I wanted to point out. Uh, it's basically meant meant the other the other woman, meaning in this case, uh, you know, we talked about him falling out of love with Josie, but he's got a dilemma. He's already married to a woman that his family has, his father has obviously arranged for financial reasons. What does he do about it? Um, she doesn't know. So what happens is, uh, uh, just to get the point of the other woman, it's, uh, it's just like Dr. Rothman was talking about with, uh, uh, brought it up in the other story, you know, with the concubine. How does a concubine feel? How does the wife feel? It, it's always that it's a dilemma in literature. There's a, it, it occurs a lot. It's, uh, it, it just draws the two parallels. It really brings out an obvious dilemma. So uh, he takes her back to China with him, basically, when she very bluntly asks him what he wants. And, uh, and uh, he replies that he loves her. And, uh, and she just says, well, I, I'll go back to China. Um, which again is a very American thing. I mean, if, if it's very non-traditional Chinese, but yet he's attracted to it. But on the way back to China, he begins to be very uh, uh, worried about what his family is going to say and how they're going to react. So uh, he, he realizes that maybe he's bitten off more than he can chew with with Josie. But he goes back to his family, and basically the what uh, the way the story ends, and it and and it, and it, and it is uh, somewhat unpredictable because he's in a dilemma and he doesn't know how he's going to deal with it. But yet his father promises him that if the, so Josie would come and live with him for 20 days, that at the end of the 20 days he would let them do whatever he wanted. So uh, uh, Josie stayed with the family. His arranged marriage wife, uh, himself and the family, remember that uh, the father and the mother spoke a different dialect than Josie did. So Josie couldn't understand that. Um, so what happened was then uh, at the end of the story, uh, he comes home from the general's office, uh, and he walks in, and they're all waiting for him. And the father uh, asks what Josie wants, which is, again, kind of ironic because it's not traditional Chinese. So Josie said that she wants to go back to America, which uh, throws Liang for a loop. And he can't understand why she would want to do that. Uh, but really, the, the moral of the story basically is the f it's beyond language, and it really ties in because this was all communicated just by being in the house for 20 days. Josie didn't want to be a part of that society. Josie didn't want to do that traditional Chinese life, and he saw that she saw that his traditional wife would love him much, much more. And so she didn't want to be a part of it. She leaves. Uh, Liang is insulted, uh, but yet the father really understands her. And w even though they didn't understand a word that they could say to each other, uh, the father got his way basically by showing them how they live. And they, and, and she went back to America, and uh, the family got what they wanted. 
and Liang would, would stay there with a devoted, loving wife, and I assume that the moral of the story is I guess he will grow to love her over time. But it was a little ironic as the way the story went. Uh, that's the way the story ends. Uh, again, Dr. Oh, Rock.